Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. One of the great days in a man's life is the day he pays off his mortgage and owns his home free and clear. If you agree, then be sure to listen to the main commercial on this program. Our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, has some interesting and important information about mortgages. You'll learn about the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, a plan that's a real money saver and a home saver, too. Be sure to listen carefully. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Frustrated Mice. In the annual study which your FBI makes of the field of crime, this year's report verified one fact which has been true since the very first survey was started. That fact is that crimes are committed by criminals in line of business. More than 50% of the people arrested in the past year showed records of previous arrests. And a recent study of the prisoners in this country showed that once a person has been to prison, there is better than an even chance that he will again be arrested after his release. Not that regeneration is not possible. Many thousands of prisoners are released every year who go out and live a decent, law-abiding life after serving their time. But mostly they are people who committed their single crime because of circumstances. They did not commit their crimes for profit or as a business. The hard fact is that once a man has been convicted of having committed a crime for profit, he will probably go on being a criminal until the very end. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small apartment located in the downtown section of a large Midwestern city. Wally Franklin, the occupant of this flat, is just ushering in a woman visitor. Throw your coat on that chair, May. Okay. If you want a drink or something, help yourself. Thanks. Working on a little problem here. It's called a fifth at Belmont Park. I saw the Duke today. Yeah? How is he? I'm worried about him, Wally. Why? What's the matter? Staying all alone up in that cabin's beginning to get the guy. Honey, not the Duke. Look, hiding out in a place for four months all alone will show on the Duke or anybody else. Why? What's he doing? Well, about a month ago, when I came up with his food, he asked me to bring some rubber boots next time I came. What do you need with them? Said that he wanted to explore the streams around the cabin. What's wrong with that? Wally, in the old days, Duke Calvert would take a cab if he was going from here to your kitchen. So now he's a Lamister. He's got nothing else to do. Two weeks ago, he asked me to bring up some lanterns. That he wanted to explore an old abandoned mine near the cabin. What's the rap on that? 
Would you go down in a mine? If something was running down there, yeah. Look, honey, you still haven't proved your point. Just wait till you hear what he asked for last week. I brought him out today. What? White mice. Huh? Half a dozen of them. White mice? Yeah. Now, do you think the joint's getting it? Yeah, that don't sound too good. Wally, we got to get him out of there. Honey, the cops are still looking for him, remember? I don't care. Look, he asked me to bring you out tomorrow. Will you come? Sure. Between the two of us, maybe we can talk him into doing something normal again, like robbing banks. <laughs> Yeah. Just a minute. Good evening, May. Wally's with me. Well, hello there, Wally. Hiya, Duke. Come in, both of you. Go on, May. Yeah. <laughs> Wally, I welcome you to Dismal Villa. Yeah, it's a good name for it. Just hang your wraps on that hook on the wall. All right. What's that? What? A big box laid out on the table there. Ah, a very interesting project. Come along and take a look at it. The uh, idea was suggested to me from one of the science magazines you brought out, May. Yeah? I just finished it this morning. Duke, what is it? Well, I guess you'd call it a miniature labyrinth. What's that mouse doing in there? He's getting a lesson in frustration. He acts like he's crazy running around like that. He isn't yet, but he will be. Huh? You see, I put cheese in that center enclosure. I let him find it several times. Then I close the entrance. He'll keep looking for that entrance until his nerves break down completely. There, Wally. What did I tell you? Yeah. What did you tell him, May? That this place is getting you. You got to get out of here. My dear girl, this is what keeps me sane. Look, I'm serious, Duke. You got to get into action. I'm going to. When? Right now, tonight. That's why I had you bring Wally out here. Duke, you mean you got a touch lined up? Yes. What is it? Take a look at this newspaper. That girl's picture there on the front page. Oh, let me see it. Yeah. Queen of Spring Festival. Alice Marshall, daughter of prominent socialite, is chosen festival queen by local florist group. Well, so what? So, she's our action. $25,000 worth. How? That's what her parents will pay to get her back. You mean we snatch her? Yes. Oh, kidnapping's a tough rap, Duke. It's a quick touch. That's what I'm interested in. Getaway money. What's the setup? I work the whole thing out. Go make us some coffee, May, and I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Oh, wait. Huh? <laughs> Look at that mouse. See how he's acting? Didn't I tell you he'd go crazy? Two days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching his desk. A visitor greets him. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Grafton, attached to headquarters. Oh, hello there. Hi. I've just been in to see your agent in charge. He told me to talk to you. Oh, fine. Sit down, Sergeant. Thank you. Well, what can I do for you? We received a report last night about 9 o'clock from a man named Marshall. He's a prominent local banker. Yes. He told us that his daughter had disappeared early yesterday afternoon. She'd last been seen leaving her class at Westside High School. I see. We got a complete description of the girl and sent out an alarm... Nothing came in on her last night. But this morning, her parents contacted us. They'd received a note saying the girl was being held for $25,000 ransom. What? I gave the note to your agent in charge. He's forwarding it to your laboratory in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sergeant, was this note mailed to the parents? No, it was left in their mailbox. Have you been able to establish where the girl went after she left school? Well, we contacted one of her classmates this morning. Yes. You see, this Marshall girl had been chosen Queen of the Spring Festival. And? Her classmates said a woman approached Alice Marshall near the school, said she was a photographer on a national magazine, and asked to take pictures of her. Mm -hmm. They drove away in the woman's car. And that's the last that was seen of her? Yes. Any description on this woman? None. Has any of this been given to the newspapers? No, the parents have requested that there be no publicity. That's good. Now, did the kidnapper suggest any means of contacting them? Yes. They asked that an ad be placed in the personal column of the Morning Star. I see. Well, Sergeant, I gather that the FBI will merely be observers in this case. That is, until it's established that they've crossed a state line with the girl or until the ransom money is paid. Yes, but uh, we would appreciate your unofficial help. And we'll be glad to give you that. Well, tell me, have the parents consented to take that ad in the paper? Yes. Fine. Sergeant, all we can do now is wait for the kidnapper's next move. <laughs> Where are you? 
I'm out here in the kitchen. Well, what are you doing? Establishing some improvements in my labyrinth. What for? We'll be out of here tomorrow night. Well, I enjoy it, May. It was too simple before, though. The mice broke down much too quickly. Where's Wally? Uh, he went into town. What for? Buy a paper to see if they ran that ad. Huh? Yes, he just called a few minutes ago. Did they run the ad? They did. Good. How's the girl? Oh, she's awake now. I just left her. I think I'd better go in and have a talk with her. What for? I've written a second note, the one telling her parents where to leave the money. I want her to sign it. Make some lunch, will you, May? Okay. Got a key to her room? Yes. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I'm your host here, Miss Marshall. I hope you're comfortable. I want to go home. When can I leave here? Well, that more or less depends upon your parents. What do you mean? How promptly they pay for your release. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, that won't do any good. Keep away from me. Don't touch now me. Now, stop cringing. Let me assure you right now that this is strictly a business proposition. Please get out of here. We have some business to take care of first. Oh, leave me alone. You're just as annoying to me as I am to you. I have a paper here that I want you to sign. Just put your signature on it, and I'll get out of here fast. Jim, are you busy? No, no. Come on in, Sergeant. Well, we've gotten results from the ad. Oh? The marshal's just received the second note. What did it say? It instructed them to put the $25,000 in a bag, all small bills. Mm -hmm. Then they're to put the bag in the trunk compartment of their daughter's car. Yes, go on. And they're to keep the trunk compartment unlocked, leave the car in a parking lot at the corner of 4th and Main Street at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. Then they've obviously gotten a description of the car from the girl. Yes. Oh, incidentally... The girl signed the note herself, so we can assume that she's still alive. Oh, I certainly hope so. Oh, by the way, we just received a teletype from Washington on that first note. Oh? What's the story? There were no fingerprints on it other than the girl's parents. The handwriting didn't check with anything in the files. Hmm. Uh, more or less figured, I guess. They also sent a report on the ink. It was manufactured by Carlton Company in 1944. The paper was a cheap variety that sold in countless five-and-dime stores. <laughs> Doesn't give us much to go on. Yes, I know. Oh, tell me, Sergeant, have the girl's parents decided to pay the ransom money? Yes. Good. Now, look, please assure them that no action will be taken by any of us until their daughter is returned safely to her home. Is that you, Wally? Yeah. Just a minute. How did you make out? Okay. Did you get the note to them? Yeah. How about the newspapers? Did they have anything on the kidnapping? No, not a word. Well, I guess they ain't gone to the cops, huh? Oh, of course they have. Evidently, they want it kept quiet. Oh. Well, what's our next move, Duke? We wait until tomorrow night. Then pick up the money. Do we all go in for it? No, that will be May's job. What's that? You're to collect the ransom money. Well, thanks. It'll be easier that way, May. Not if I'm picked up. They'll be too smart to do that. Don't forget, we warned them. If there was any hitch, they'd never see the girl again alive. Well, what do I do with the money when I get it? You call here, then come out and pick us up. What about the girl? What do you mean? When do you release her? We don't. Huh? Oh, that'd be a sucker play, my dear. You mean, when we blow, we take her with us? No, stupid. She stays here. Yeah, but then she could tip off the cops. She won't tip anyone off, Wally. She'll be dead. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. One of the most beautiful words in our language. A word that paints a picture of happiness and contentment, peace and security. And it is to guard that security, to protect that home, that the Equitable Life Assurance Society created its famous Assured Home Ownership Plan. What's that, Mr. Keating? It's an insured mortgage plan. You see, in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, you get these four advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. 
It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. You mean if I get hard up or lose my job, this cash fund takes care of the mortgage payments for me? Yes. For instance, at the end of five years, the cash fund would be sufficient to carry your mortgage installments for nearly a whole year. You see, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Finally, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyers' fees, and other closing costs. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Frustrated Mice. As is proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, one crime leads to another in a criminal's career. And no crime is too brutal if it serves his purpose. Here, it is the plan to compound kidnapping with murder, with the willful taking of a human life. That callous disregard for other human beings, that sudden decision to murder this one and spare that one, is all a part of the criminal's ego. He feels power because he can decide on whether someone shall live or die. And his pitiful inferiority feeds on that power. Whether his name is Hitler, Mussolini, or the criminal in tonight's case, Duke Calvert, he never realizes that there is a consistent record behind every such quest for power. And the record shows that in every case, lust has proven self-destructive. Tonight's file continues at the kidnapper's cabin. 24 hours have elapsed. Duke Calvert and his confederate are seated at the living room table. <laughs> Wally, look at this. Huh? Just watch that mouse. He's completely frustrated. Duke, if you don't mind, I'll just read this magazine. Huh? Oh, does this bother you? Yeah. Why? I just can't help betting on the mouse. <laughs> look at that little devil. <laughs> I wonder how she's making out. Uh, oh, May? Yeah. She should have collected that dough by now. Oh, nothing can go wrong. I hope you're right. Relax, Wally, relax. Hey. I'll get it. Think that's May? I imagine so. Hello? Duke? Oh, yes, May. I got the dough. Any trouble? None that I know of. Where are you now? In a lunch wagon just outside of town. Get out here as fast as you can. Right. How'd it go, Duke? Fine. Where is she? On her way out here. Oh, good. Now, Wally... I think it's time we took care of the girl. Duke, you're really going to kill her? Of course. Where's your key? Oh, I have it right... Wait a minute. What? Oh, it was in his pocket. Yeah, wait a second. Maybe it's over... No. Have you lost it? Oh, I got it here someplace. Never mind. There's an extra one on the shelf. I couldn't have lost the whole ring of keys. This will let us in. Wait. Huh? That other door, the back door, it's open. The girl's gone. Gone? Yes. How could she get out that door? There's your answer. What? Your bunch of keys. They're in that lock. She got them and opened it. Yeah, I don't get it. Look, how could she get out the... When did you see her last? I... I don't know. Think. About an hour ago? There's no telling how far she's gotten, you stupid fool. Look, Duke, I, I couldn't help it. Duke, everybody makes mistakes. But you're not making any more. <laughs> Jim, the girl's in this room. Motorist brought her here to headquarters about 20 minutes ago. Good. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks. Miss Marshall? Yes? This is Mr. Taylor. He's a special agent of the FBI. Hello. Hello, Miss Marshall. 
you feel well enough to tell us your story now? Yes. Fine. I, I was being held in a cabin. There were three of them, two men and a woman. I, I was kept locked in a room all the time I was there. Cabin was across the state line, Jim. I see. Go ahead, Miss Marshall. Well, tonight, one of the men came in my room and forgot his keys. When he left, I used one of the keys to open the back door. Mm-hmm. I ran out, kept running until I came to a highway. And that's when the motorist picked you up? Yes. Where are my father and mother? They've been notified that you're here. They're on their way over. Oh, thank heaven. Miss Marshall, can you give us a description of these three people? Well, yes, I'm sure I can. And how about the cabin? Do you think you could lead us to it? Yes, I believe I could. Good girl. Sergeant, let's get a description of the people, send out an alarm, and then we'll try and find that cabin. <laughs> you may yeah just stay right in the car what's the matter turn around quick look what's wrong do as i say okay now what is it what's happened the girl got away what how our dear friend wally left his keys in her room oh brother when was this oh a couple of hours ago i guess jerk where is he now back in the cabin you left him there? I wasn't interested in bringing a corpse. He's dead? Yes, my dear. He's very dead. That's kind of rough, Duke. I refuse to put up with stupidity. I see what you mean. Where do we go now? Just keep heading down the hill. Then what? When you hit the highway, head south. Well, don't you think the cop... Wait a minute. Huh? Down to the bottom of the hill. Two sets of headlights, two cars coming up. Yeah. Stop the car. Why? No one but cops would be coming up this private road. The girls evidently led them here. Now... Where's the money? Oh, the bag's right there on the floor. Is there a flashlight in the car? A glove compartment. Get it. Okay. I'll take the money. All right, come on. Where are we going? Up this hill. You can't go that way. That's sheer cliff. Just follow me. The cops are bound to come along May, and... May, listen. Do you remember that abandoned mine I told you about? You brought me the lantern so I could explore it? Yeah. One of the passageways in that mine cuts right through the hill. It opens onto a lake. We can pick up a boat there. Oh, I get it. All right, then. Hurry. <laughs> Sergeant, slow the car down. There's another car up ahead. Yeah, I see it. Oh, the cabin's right up there. Oh, good. The car's blocking the road. We'll have to stop. Miss Marshall, get on the floor, please. We may have some trouble. Oh, surely. Huh. I don't see anyone in that car. Come on, let's have a look. I'll tell the boys in the car behind to cover us. All right. Cover us, boys. Okay. I got my flashlight. Come on, Sergeant. Yeah, it certainly looks empty. Yes, the door is open. Uh-huh. There's no one in it. Uh, Jim. Yes? The motor's still warm. And this must be the kidnapper's car. They were probably making a getaway when they saw our headlights. Right. Sergeant, look here. What? Footprints. A man and a woman's, and they lead up the hill. Yeah. Sergeant, tell your men to take Miss Marshall with them up to the cabin. I think we'd better follow these footprints. Yes, what is it? Oh, that flashlight. Still, I can't see where I'm walking. Very well. You sure you know where you're going? Of course. I've explored this place a dozen times. How can you tell which passage is the right one? We're going past at least a dozen of them. Are you trying to confuse me? Of course not. Well, then please be quiet. Oh, wait. What? We've come to a dead end. Huh? I'd have sworn this was the right way out. You mean we're lost? I don't think so. You said you knew the way. Well, let's go back. It must be the last turn. But you're not sure. Let's go back, I said. Come on. Jim. Yes, Sergeant? I think I have an idea where these footprints are going to lead us. Really? I'll know for sure as soon as we get up this little hill. Oh, good. Yeah, just as I thought. What? Flash your light over there. Okay. Well, it looks like the entrance to a mine. It's just what it is. It was abandoned many years ago. I used to play up here when I was a kid. Look, those footprints lead right into it. Yeah. Taken quite a chance going in there. It's quite a labyrinth. Sergeant, do you remember it well enough for us to follow them? Yeah. Well, I think I do. Good, then let's go.
Well, where is it? What? It's the passage, the one you missed. It, it should be right here. Right around this corner. Oh! Oh, what is it? Big rat ran out ahead of us. Oh, please stop being so jumpy. Come on. Okay. Wait a minute. What now? There are four different ways to go here. I don't know which one to take. Look, I thought you said... We'll, you... we'll, we'll follow this one on the left. Come on. Luke! Oh, what do you want? What do you don't want? Don't go so fast, please. You want us to get out of here, don't you? Yeah. Well... Then we've got to move. Keep moving. You hear me? I hear you. Oh! Don't you hurt? Oh, my... My ankle. Oh, where's the flashlight? I... I dropped it. Oh. Oh, it's right... Right here someplace. Yeah? Let me look for it, man. Yeah? You hear me? I can't see. Have you any matches? No. Oh, now we're really in a fix. Can't even see. We're lost in this darkness. Don't stop it. How are we going to get out of here? Can't even find the place we came in. Look, you're acting like one of those mice in that, that labyrinth. Yes. That's what we are, May. We are those mice. Duke. We're trapped just like they were. All right, down there. There we are. Who is that? Got to get out of here. Don't Duke. move. Either one of you. Oh, God. I've got to get out of here. Get out of here. Stay with me. Yes. Duke, what do we do? Take the girl, Sergeant. Right. I'll bring this man along with me. <laughs> Calvert was sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping, then turned over to state authorities for prosecution for the murder of his confederate. His girlfriend, May, was sent to prison for life for her part in the kidnapping. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you have another example of how weak even a strong criminal is, of how little chance there is for anyone to succeed in a life of crime. Because his plans went wrong at one point, the entire structure also fell. But even if everything had gone the way he planned, he would not have escaped. For your FBI does not allow kidnapping cases to remain unsolved. That is part of their credo. And what is even more important, that is also part of their record. Just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. I've been doing some thinking, Mr. Keating, and I've decided to see if I qualify for one of those assured home ownership plans. Let's hope you do, Henry, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Traveler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Traveler on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents 
This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society representative in your community. Homeowners, attention please. Have you heard about the assured home ownership plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society? If not, be sure to listen carefully to the middle commercial. Find out why this Equitable Society plan is both a money saver and a home saver. Find out why the Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Reluctant Thief. Every study made into the field of crime by your FBI in recent years has shown that juvenile delinquency is the number one problem facing law enforcement agencies all over the nation. The most recent study covering all crimes committed in the past year is no exception. Year by year, America is producing more and more junior criminals. Youngsters who will, unless headed off, Keep the crime wave mounting. For example, and this is only one of the frightening statistics produced by the study, the number of youngsters arrested in 1946 between the ages of 18 and 20 was 24% higher than in 1945. That is a jump of almost one quarter. And as if to prove the inevitable consequences of the juvenile delinquents who grew up through the war years, Arrests in the age bracket of 21 to 24 rose more than 64%. The time to do something about the juvenile delinquency problem is now, for tomorrow may be too late. Tonight's FBI file opens in a modest frame house located in the suburbs of a small eastern city. A stout, middle-aged woman is tidying up the living room of this dwelling. As the front doorbell rings, the woman hurries to the door and opens it. Hiya, Mom. Eddie. Yeah. Oh, son, it's so good to see you. (laughs) Oh, goodness, let's not stand out here. Come in, son, come in. Okay, Mom, sure. Oh, now let me have a good look at you. Look okay? Wonderful. One thing I can say for the school, they sure fed me good. They must have. Goodness, how you've grown. Well, it's been almost a year, Mom. That's right, it has. Hey, where's Joey? Oh, he's out, out playing. Didn't he know I'd be home this afternoon? Well, uh, yes, he did. What's the matter? Didn't you want to see his own brother? Uh, Son, Joey is... Uh, well, I've been having quite a bit of trouble with him lately. What about? He just refuses to pay any attention to what I tell him. Oh, wise guy stuff, huh? Not really. After all, he's only 15. Well, that's old enough to know better, Ma. He'll learn, Eddie. Right now, he just doesn't seem to understand. Well, look, will you let me have a talk with him? Oh, I wish you would. Oh, heaven, son, you must be starved. Now, you go inside and get washed, and I'll set out your dinner. Wait, Mom, why don't you let me... Is that you, Joey? Yeah, Mom. Well, come on in here, Eddie's home. Oh. Hiya, Joey. Hello, Eddie. Well, Joey, aren't you going to say you're glad to see him? Glad to see you, Eddie. That's better. Joey, where are you going? In my room. Wait a minute. Huh? I want to talk to you. Well... Joey, Mom says you've been giving her trouble while I was away. How? Not minding it. That ain't so. Look, kid, Mom just told me. Now, just a minute, both of you. I didn't say that Joey didn't mind me. It's just that he's slow. He doesn't understand. I can't help that. You certainly can, son. People aren't born thieves. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of practice. But I don't like stealing. (laughs) Get him. I mean it. 
I'd rather be doing things like other kids do. How square can you get? Now, don't pick on him, Eddie. I know how the boy feels. His Uncle Ben was the same way when he was a kid. So what? So, when my mother finished with him, he turned out to be the best safe cracker this side of the Mississippi. Well, he ain't no Uncle Ben. He can be. Now that you're home again and can work right with him, he'll pick up things in no time. Maybe. Say, you must have picked up some new tricks at the reform school that you could teach him. Yeah. Then starting tomorrow, you can take your brother right under your wing. <laughs> On the outskirts of the same city at the local police pistol range, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor has accepted an invitation for an afternoon of practice. Jim, Hmm? Jim Taylor. Yes? Hello there, you remember me? Sure, you're Tom Gelford. That's right. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Swell. You were at the police academy last year when I was taking my refresher course. Right. When did you get into town? Several days ago. Oh, I've been temporarily assigned to our local field office here. Say, how about having dinner with me one night this week? Why, sure. How's Friday night? Friday? Friday's fine. And, uh, do you mind if I mix a little business with the food? <laughs> Not at all, Tom. Our police chief has just assigned me to head up our juvenile delinquency bureau. Oh, I see. I know you fellas are interested in the problem. I had to call on you for some advice. Well, I'll be glad to help you with anything I can, sir. Swell. Say, there's a target free now. Let's do a little shooting, huh? I'm out here in the kitchen, son. Well, dinner will be ready, boy. I'm starved. Yeah, we'll eat just as soon as these potatoes boil. Where's Joey? Oh, he stopped off at the candy store. Oh, did you work with him today? Yeah. How'd it go? Oh, he's coming along. Still kind of stupid, though. Ed, you've just got to be patient with the boy. Now, what did you have him do? Well, I took him to the five and dime store. Had him lift a few things. Novelty stuff, you know. Yes? Well, he'd done that clean enough. What else? Oh, he snatched a purse right out of a dame's hand while she was parking her car. Any trouble? No, I lost himself in the crowd pretty good. Well, that sounds like he's doing fine. Why do you say he's still stupid? Well, Mom, because you can see he ain't getting no kicks. It's, it's like work to him. Oh, he'll get over that. Uh, Just wait till we get to the big city. What big city? New York. When are we going there? Tomorrow night, if we're lucky. Huh. What do we use for money? You and Joey are going to get it. Oh. I've got a job all cased out for you. Yeah? Well, what's the setup? A big house out in Brentwood. A friend of mine worked out there. She nailed the combination to the safe. She gave it to you? Yeah. The people who own the place are out of town, and there's no one there but a caretaker. <laughs> Boy, that sounds like a breeze. Well, it'll have to be a daytime job. Caretaker naps every day from two to four. That's when you and jo- Joey move in. What do we need him for? Well, you'll need a lookout. Besides, he can use the experience. Oh, okay. Well, what's in the safe, do you know? Cash and jewelry. Hey, that should take us to New York real good. Oh, yes, that's what I've always lived for. Once my two boys get on the big time, I know they'll go right to the top. <laughs> Where's the safe? It's supposed to be right behind this picture. There's a catch here someplace. Find it? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Look, you stay by that door. Okay. Eddie, what is it? Did you open it yet? Of course not, stupid. These take time. Oh. Hey, what, Eddie? Give me one of them cigarettes. Where are they? On the table there. Okay, do you need me? Oh, you stupid! I couldn't help it, Eddie. I caught the lamp with my elbow. Shut up. Get back by the door. Listen for that caretaker. Okay. You hear anything? No. I still better hurry with this thing. Eddie. Huh? Someone's coming downstairs. Listen. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Stay put. But we can't Get behind the door and shut up. Someone here? Who's behind that door? Come out. I've got you covered. Now, let's get that safe open. Have some more coffee, Jim? Oh, thanks, Tom. Call me the story. Well, as I told you, wall safe was robbed and the caretaker was slugged. Mm-hmm. I questioned the caretaker just before I came over here. 
He Where said the two youngsters did the job. One about 17, the other about 14. Did he know them? No, I'd never seen them before. Well, could he give you a description of the boys? No, he couldn't. All was taken from the safe. The money and jewelry, worth about 5000 you know. Right. Tom, is there any interstate angle? No, unfortunately, there isn't. Hmm. Did you pick up any fingerprints around the safe? Uh, none at all. These kids work like pros. Well, Tom, you don't seem to have much to go on. Well, I did pick up one clue. Oh, what was that? Now, this uh, class bin. I found it on the floor near the safe. You see, huh? Thanks. Class of 1950, huh? Yeah, that was issued at Northside High School. Well, then it's pretty safe to assume that one of the boys goes there. Yeah. Tom, what time this afternoon did that robbery occur? Approximately 3.15. And how far is Brentwood from Northside High? It's over 15 miles. Well, let's see. If school was out at 3, then the boy who did the job must have skipped school today. I've already covered that angle, Jim. I oh. contacted the principal. He's going to gather a list of all absentees in the class of 1950. Good. I'm going to check up on those boys tonight. Yeah, Mom. Are you all finished packing? Uh-huh. My bag's out in the hall. Where's Joey? In his room. He's packing, too, I guess. <laughs> I wonder if he can even do that right. Eddie, you've complained enough about him. Look, Mom, I'm only beginning. When I think of the jam he almost got us in today, we could both be in the clink right now. He couldn't help what he did. Mom, I'm not talking about knocking the lamp over. I mean when he kicked that dog. The poor boy was nervous. He had stage fright. It was his first big job. Mom, I'm telling you right now, you're wasting your time with that guy. He just ain't got no talent. Son, let's not start that again. Why do you bring him to New York? Why don't you send him to live with Aunt Mary? Oh, Ed. Why not? And have him wind up working in the bank. Your Aunt Mary is so honest, she... Oh, that must be Mrs. Carson. She's lending me an extra suitcase. Just a minute. Oh, uh, yes? Mrs. Clinton? That's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Guilford. In my badge. Well? I'd like to talk to you a minute, please. Can I come in? Of course. Come ahead. Uh, who is it, Ma? Uh, a detective. Huh? Um, what can I do for you, mister? You have a son named Joe? That's right. Is he at home? No. Where is he? Out playing. Do you know why he didn't go to school today? Why, what are you talking about? Joey went to school. Not according to the records, Mrs. Clinton. Well, I'm going out back a minute, Ma. Hey, just a minute, son. Huh? Are you Joe's brother? Yeah, that's right. Is your name Edward? Yes. I believe you just completed serving a sentence in the state reformatory. That's right. I'm afraid I'm going to have to find out where you were today, too. Look, what's this all about? There was a robbery out in Brentwood, Mrs. Clinton. Two boys were involved. Oh, goodness. One of them dropped this class pin. It's from Northside High School, class 1950. That's your son Joe's class. Well, I know that Joey didn't have anything to do with... I finished packing, Mom. Now should I... Who's this guy? He's a cop, Joey. Huh? I thought he was out playing. Uh, he uh, he must have come in the back way. I want to talk to you, son. Uh, what about? This pin. You ever see it before? Why? It was found on the floor in a house out in Brentwood that was broken into this afternoon. Two boys did the job. I, I don't know nothing about it. Where were you today? I was... I was in school. Not according to the records? Yeah, that's where I was, I tell you. You're lying, son. Look, I, I don't know anything about that robbery. Then where were you this afternoon? I was... Eddie, Mom, help me. I'm asking you, son. Leave me alone. Where were you this afternoon, Joey? Please. Answer me. Eddie, help me. Sure, kid. Oh, Eddie, my boy, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. We work and save to buy the house we live in. It shelters us from the wind and the rain. Witnesses our joys and sorrows. Our home. The more home means to you, the more interested you will be in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Sounds like it was made to order for me. That's right. There's no plan for homeowners like it. Just listen to these four advantages. First, 
During the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Second, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Third, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. You mean my wife would inherit our home? Yes, she would. Free and clear? Yes, she would. And interest charges stop the day of death. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your equitable society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Reluctant Thief. There may be those of you who are listening to this program who doubt that any mother ever existed like the one in tonight's case in the files of your FBI. In a book entitled The Story of the FBI, recently published by E.P. Dutton, you will find in text and pictures the true story of a mother who went even further. A mother named Ma Barker who taught her four children the gentle art of murder. Or maybe you're thinking that this case doesn't apply to you because you're not teaching your children to cheat and lie and steal. But it does apply to you because the road to juvenile delinquency is paved with the neglect of parents. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor, returning to his desk, finds a visitor waiting for him. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm Dick Rutland, Lieutenant of Detectives over at headquarters. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. I've heard of you. I'm glad to know you. Oh, yeah. Well, I hope you haven't been waiting long. No, no. I just got here just a few minutes ago. Fine. Well, what can I do for you? Well, this isn't a very happy mission I'm on. Oh? I've come here to tell you about Tom Guilford. Why? What's wrong? He was shot what? and seriously wounded last night. What? We didn't find him until this morning. He'd been driven across the bridge and dumped out on the other side of the river. How is he now? The doctors say he's off the danger list. Oh, good. What about visitors? He wants to see you. In fact, he sent me over here to get you. Where is he, Lieutenant? Memorial Hospital. Let's get right over there. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello, Jim. Uh, just take it easy, boy. Keep your head down. Okay. I hear you're doing fine. Sure, I'm okay. Swell. Uh, sit down, Jim. Okay, thanks. Did they, uh... Tell you what happened. Uh, look, I think I have this story. You just let me repeat it to you, huh? Right. Now, you went to see a family named Clinton. Mother and two sons. One son just out of the reform school. The other goes to Northside High. That's right. As you were questioning them, the older boy pulled a gun and shot you. Uh-huh. Then they put you in the back seat of your own car, drove across the river, and when they hit an isolated stretch of road, they dumped you up. Right. Then they obviously... Wait, Jim. Hmm? What's the matter? Crossing the river took me into another state... Over the state line brings the FBI in. That's right. They kind of got you into this the hard way, huh? Yes, I should say you did. Well, to review the rest of it. An alarm has already been sent out on your car, Tom. So far, there's nothing on that. The Clinton house was searched, but no clue was found as to where they were going. Oh, one thing, Jim. Yes? Someplace along the way, I must have come to. Oh. I'm sure I heard one of them say something about going to New York. Well, the New York police have already been alerted to watch out for the Clintons and your car. Good. New York field office have been notified, too, so something should turn up from one of those sources. I hope so. Now, look, Tom, there's only one thing for you to worry about now. That's getting better. So now close your eyes and get some sleep. Yes. How'd you make up? Fine. Did you see the fence? Yes, he was a very nice man, an old friend of your Uncle Ben. Well, what did he give you for the jewelry? $1,800. Is that all? 
son, when you do business with the fence, especially one here in New York, you take what he offers you. Where's Joey? In the bedroom, getting dressed. Look, Mom, when are you going to have a talk with that guy? Oh, now's as good a time as any. Call him in here. Okay. Joey. Yeah? Come in here. Ma wants you. Okay. What is it, Mom? I want to have a talk with you, son. Well? Sit down. Okay. Joey, you've done several things now that have gotten us into a great deal of trouble. You were forcing Eddie to shoot that cop could have finished all of us. Yeah, I, I know. Fortunately, we got away with it. But we can't afford to have you make any more mistakes. Now, if I give you one more chance, will you promise to behave yourself? Okay, Mom. Oh, that's my good boy. I'm left you. Oh, now, let's see. I left a grocery list here someplace. It's right on the table there, Mom. Oh, here. Take this list, Joey. Here's some money. I want you to go to the store. Okay. Hey, stupid. Why? Let's see if you can handle something legitimate without getting into trouble. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Dick Rutland. Oh, yes, Dick. I just left Tom Guilford. He's feeling much better. Oh, swell. I've just got some news that should make him really feel better. What's that? I got a call about an hour ago from our New York office. They've located Guilford's car. Really? Yes, it was found abandoned on the Lower East Side. I see. And just a few minutes ago, the New York police called. Yes? They picked up a boy. When they questioned him, he... 40 minutes. Can you meet me at the station? Sure, Jim. Good. I'll see you at the ticket window. Boy's right in this room here, Lieutenant. Oh, fine. Go ahead. Thanks. Hello, Joey. Hello. I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? That's right. And this is Lieutenant Rutland. He's from your hometown. Oh. Joey, we've come here to find out where your mother and brother are. I... I can't tell you. Look, son, your brother is wanted on a very serious charge. He shot a policeman. <laughs> Now, you'd better tell us where we can find it. I... I can't. I can't, honest. Why not? I... I promise not to mess him up anymore. Please. Please don't make me tell. Look, son. We know they're somewhere in this neighborhood. We will find them eventually ourselves. Now, why don't you help us and save us that trouble? Look. Look, you can talk to me forever. I'm... I'm not squealing. Jim, this is the same routine he's been giving the New York police ever since they picked him up. Yes, I know. Joey... Do you know anything about the law? Why? You were present when that policeman was shot. He'd come to your house to pick you up. That makes you an accessory to the shooting. You know what that means, son? No. It means you can be sent away for a long term if we never find your mother and brother. Do you realize that? I... I don't care. I still ain't gonna talk. Son, you'd better listen Wait to what minute, I... Wait a minute, Huh? Joey, is this your jacket? Yes, sir. We don't have to question him anymore, Dick. I know where they can be found. Eddie. Huh? Oh, what time is it? Ten after six. Oh, what could have happened to him? He left here over four hours ago. I know, I know. Do you think he could have gotten lost? No. He's missing. There's only one reason for it. He's in trouble again. Oh, dear. Now look, Mom, if he's in trouble, he's most likely been picked up. Do you think so? Sure, if he's picked up, he's going to talk. Oh, no. Mom, he's bound to. If he talks, we better not stay here much longer. He wouldn't squeal on his own mother and brother. He's stupid enough to do anything. Wait. Huh? Might be the cops. Well, it could also be Joey. I'm going to find out. Who is it? It's, it's me, Mom. Joey. Oh, thank heaven. Where have you been? I... I got picked up. By the cops? Yeah. What for? I... I tried to steal some groceries. <gasps> you what? Mom, I thought you'd be proud of me. How'd you get away from them? I didn't get away. What? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh, you little stool pigeon. You tipped them off where we were. No, I didn't. Your mother tipped us off. I... Uh, what do you mean? I found this grocery list in his jacket, Mrs. Clinton. You wrote it on the back of the stationery of this apartment hotel. Oh. All right, now come along, all of you. The 
Saturday, Clinton family were turned over to the local authorities. Young Joey was sentenced to a reformatory. His brother Eddie's parole was revoked and he was sentenced to 10 years in a state prison. The mother was prosecuted as an accessory and aider and abettor to theft and was sent to prison for 15 years. In connection with tonight's case from the files of your FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has this to say to you listeners. I quote, Juvenile delinquency is the number one problem of not only your FBI, but of every law enforcement agency in the country. Children constitute one-fourth of the population of our nation and 100% of the future of the country. For that reason alone, we dare not allow another day to go by without interesting ourselves in the problem of how to help the children of America. That is a problem that concerns you because the solution to it lies in your own hometown. There are civic groups in your community who are trying to combat the evil. Join them and fight with them. They need your help because it is important that the children of the country know that the adult population is not composed of their enemies, but of their friends. This is the time to prove to your own conscience that you are indeed your brother's keeper. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. What you said about the assured home ownership plan impressed me a lot, Mr. Keating. I'm going to find out if I can qualify. I certainly hope you can, Ted, because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your Equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Frustrated Mice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Frustrated Mice on This Is Your FBI. Now stay tuned for Break the Bank, radio's biggest money-paying quiz show. Match your knowledge against contestants trying for $1,000 or more. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Do you own your own home? Is there a mortgage on it? Be sure to listen to the special message to homeowners from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. In just 14 minutes, you'll hear about America's finest plan for home ownership. 
It's the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Don't miss it. Tonight's FBI file, The Professional Killer. Your FBI not only pursues every criminal who violates a federal statute, but it also makes a close, keen, analytical study of the field of crime all over the nation. For crime is the business your FBI is engaged in. And like every successful organization, it realizes that the more it knows about its business, the better job it'll be able to do. With that in mind, your FBI recently completed a study of crime throughout the 48 states. And the study brought forth one fact that is not only shocking, but is also indicative of the self-evident proof that the crime wave, unless stifled quickly, will soon be out of hand. That one single fact is that in the United States today and every day, there are 36 people murdered. In the past two hours, three people have been killed by criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small, smart nightclub located in a large Midwestern city. In an office in the rear of this establishment, Larry Mansfield, the owner of the club, is just greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. West. Okay. You use cigars? No. When did you get to town? A couple of hours ago. Well, you, you made good time. I want to get out just as quick. Very well. We'll get right down to business. Good. Are you familiar with this town? Not very. Do you know where the Central Hotel is? No, but I'll find it. It's over on the west side. It's a small hotel. You may have... Can a cab get there? Yes. You get the directions. Just give me the address. Okay. Here it is. Right. The party I want taken care of lives in the Central Hotel. Room 819. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Here's the key. What's the party's name? Sanford. Sanford. Get it. Uh, West. Yeah. How do you intend to handle the killing? Why? Well, I just thought in as much as this is a hotel you're going Mr. to... Mr. Mansfield, let's get something straight, huh? You own this nightclub, don't you? Yeah. Am I telling you how to run it? No. It don't tell me how to run my business. Oh. Uh, sorry. What about Doe? I'll pay when the job is done. You come back here tomorrow night. I don't want to wait around that long. What's the matter with tomorrow morning? I won't be here. Oh, where do you live? I'll come there. All right. Here's my card. Thanks. Uh, guess it's time I went to work. sweetheart. Who, who are you? That don't matter. Well, how look, did you get... Look, look. I got a gun here. Let me ask the questions. Go ahead. You live in this room? Yeah. What's your name? Sanford. Well, where's your husband? I don't have one. Well, where's your brother then, your father? That's a blank too, mister. Well, who else lived in this room with you? Nobody. You live here alone? Yeah. This is no sure. Where are you going? I'm getting out of here. Wait a minute. Out of my way. I want to ask you one question. Well. Who sent you here? Nobody. Look, honey, I've been around. I know a hired gunsel when I see one. Fact. Yes, that is your touch, right? You're right. Now tell me who paid you to come here. No dice. Was it a guy named Mansfield? Was it? We've had my business. We always protect a client. Oh, I know it was Mansfield. I should have figured he'd make this kind of a place. Look, what difference does it make who it was? You come off lucky, didn't you? Yeah. And forget it. Now, let me get out of here. Wait a minute. One more question. What now? You were paid to get rid of me. 
Why didn't you do it? Look, I don't... I want to know. I don't kill James. Oh. Do you uh, buy Dame's drinks? Sometimes. I'm awful thirsty. In the same city, a bit later that evening, in the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from an assignment. Jim. Oh, yes, Neil. A call came in for you less than five minutes ago. I took the message. Oh, what was it? Interstate bus company. Oh, yeah. The driver you wanted to see is out of town. He'll come over to see you first thing in the morning. Oh, good. What are you working on? Well, it's kind of a strange assignment, Neil. Well, what's the story? Well, a thief named Lou Palmer was convicted two years ago for sticking up a bank messenger. Over $78,000 was stolen on that job. Hmm. And the money was never recovered. I see. A few days ago, Palmer sent word to the warden at State's prison that he wanted to give some information as to the whereabouts of the money. What brought that on? Well, it turned out to be revenge. Palmer revealed that he had two Confederates on the job, a man and a woman. They evidently promised to take care of Palmer's family out of the loop. When they reneged, he talked. Who were these people? Well, the man's name was Larry Kent. The woman, she was Kent's girl. Her name was Vi Sanford. And you're looking for them? That's right. What progress have you made? Well, we've established that Kent and his girl were living in Cleveland at the time of the robbery. Immediately after it, Kent disappeared. Well, what about the Sanford girl? Oh, she stayed on there. Evidently, Kent had walked out on her. She was living in a cheap room and working as a cashier in a restaurant. Kent apparently wound up with all the money. That's it. Has the girl been picked up? No, she left Cleveland two days ago, believed to be headed for here. I see. And from what we could gather, she's looking for Kent. She'd been tipped off that he was here. Jim, do you know where to find her? No, not yet. This bus driver I sent for may help us on that, though. She was on his bus. You alerted the local police? Yes, I gave them the girl's picture, and they're starting a check on all hotels now. We should get something on her very soon. Oh, Phil, I could go on for hours with all the details, but that's more or less the story. Sounds like a nice guy. Oh, charming. Look, baby, when he walked out on you, didn't he leave you any part of that 78000 No. How about the guy in the can? Did he do anything for him? Lee Palmer? Yeah. Not a nickel's worth. <sighs> Phil, can we have another drink? Yeah, sure, honey. Well, waiter, let's have the same thing. Right. Why? How did you tell him here? Well, like I told you, I was a cashier in this joint in Cleveland. Yeah. An old-time grifter came in one night and slipped me a note when he paid his check. Uh-huh. The note said he'd seen Kent in this town, that he was using his old name. That's Mansfield. Oh. It also said he was doing what he always wanted to do. Well, I knew that meant he was operating a nightclub. So? So I called enough joints till I finally nailed him. He must have been real surprised, huh? Plenty. Well, did you ask him for your cut? Oh, of course. He said he'd bring it to me tonight. Instead, he sent you. He did send you, didn't he? Yeah. I knew it. Are you sorry? Not now. Here you are. Just set him down. Right. Phil. Yeah, baby. How much was he paying you? For knocking you off? Hmm. Five bills. Did you collect? No. You know, he owes me a pretty good chunk. My end of that job was over 20000 Solid numbers. If you'll take a marker, how would you like to work for me? Baby, you just made yourself a deal. Oh, morning, Neil. Talk to the bus driver? Yes, he just left here. Did he give you anything? Well, I showed him the Sanford girl's picture, and he definitely identified her. Said she'd come in on his bus all right. Mm, did he have any idea where she went? Oh, unfortunately, he didn't. Uh, these pictures just came in, Jim. No, what are they? Pictures of Kent. Oh, fine. Washington also sent a copy of his record. Swell, Miss Kent. Surely, here you are. Thanks. 
I read it through. There's nothing there at all to indicate where he's been for the last two years. No, I didn't imagine there would be. After all, he wound up with that 78000 and that's enough for a man to retire on for a few years, at least. Mm. Do you think he's gone into some legitimate business? Mm, could have. Well, even if he's here in town, he won't be easy to find. Probably changed his name, even his appearance. Yes, I know. Jim, I sent Kent's pictures and a copy of his record to the local police. They might have something on him. Fine, I sure hope so. Oh, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes, that's right. Wait, I'll, I'll write that down. Okay. Good work, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Well, Neil, we're getting some action. What, Jim? That was police headquarters. The Sanford girl is registered at the Central Hotel. I think I'd better get right over there. get into my apartment. You told me to come here. Not while I was out. I don't like to hang around in hallways. I don't like intruders. That makes a saving. Did you go to the Central Hotel last night? Yeah. Well? Well, what? Did you take care of that party? No. Huh? Why not? You didn't tell me it was a dame. What difference does that make? That's out of my line. Look, I made a deal with you. I got a better offer. What do you mean? Better let me tell him so. Huh? Why? Hello, Larry. Why? Where did you come from? Mr. West brought me here. What? He's in a brand new business. Now he brings him back alive. What's this all about? Give him a rundown, baby. Sure. Mr. West here is working for me now. Now, look. I told him our whole story, Larry. He figures that I'm a lot more reliable to do business with. What are you talking about? Seventy-eight thousand dollars. Huh? That's the amount you ran out with. Remember? Now, why? In the Save first the place... Save the alibis. We haven't got time for that. We haven't got time for any chatter. We just came here to collect. Collect what? My end. I figured it out on the way over. It comes to twenty-six thousand dollars. This whole thing's ridiculous. I want my cut, Larry, now. You're not getting anything. Mister, you're in no position to talk that way. You keep out of this. I gotta protect my interests. I'm on the payroll. Get out of here, both of you. Bill, show him we mean business, huh? Sure, baby. Now, wait a minute. Bill. Few more treatments, honey. You'll collect. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. home of my own. That's what I've worked and saved for all these years. My home, my family. If home means a lot to you, then investigate the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. A home saver, you say? That's right. Just listen to these four advantages of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. First, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Second, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Third, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, if the owner dies the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. You mean my wife would inherit our home free and clear? Yes, she would. And interest charges stop the day of death. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an Equitable Society assured home ownership plan. Who can tell me if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station 
to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Professional Killer. How many times have you heard the expression, there is honor among thieves? Probably a thousand times. But next time you hear it, you'll know that it is not true. For as proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, criminals do not base their actions on loyalty, but on profit. They're always available to the highest bidder. The tragic thing is that they never learn that man cannot live alone without friendships and alliances. But what is true of nations is also true of people. And if the last war proved nothing else, it proved beyond doubt that every nation is dependent upon every other nation and that every person on earth is dependent in some measure on every other living human being. Tonight's file continues in Larry Mansfield's apartment. Mansfield, still unconscious, is stretched out on the floor. The erstwhile girl, Vi Sanford, and her gunman confederate are searching the premises. You find anything in that desk, honey? No, not yet. Let's see what's in this drawer. I think it'll be a wall safe behind one of these pictures. Oh, this is full of nothing but letters. Why, that dirty chief. These letters are from Dames. What's the matter? Look at this. This letter was written three years ago. I was still going with him then. My darling Larry, our date last night will be remembered always. How do you like that guy? That being a female, we got work to do. Look, there's no dough on his desk. Where else can we... Wait a minute. He's coming to him. You better watch him. Yeah, we can right beside him. Okay. How do we handle it now? We find out where his dough is. Otherwise, he gets a full treatment. Good. What? What hit me? You were standing right on the track, mister. Oh. Next time, you won't get off so easy. Can... Can I get up? There we are. Uh... Larry, we want to continue our discussion. Before you left us, we were talking about $26,000. Uh, I don't know. The girl wants her money, mister. But I... I tell you... Look! I... Let me tip you off. From now on, I use a gun. I'll get it up. I... I haven't got it here. Where is it? In my office at the club. Where in the office? In a safe. Okay. I want you to call the club. Tell them I'm coming over. Tell them I'm getting something out of that safe to bring back to you. Very, very well. How about the combination? I'll give it to her. Let me have it now. Jim. I'm right down here, Neil. I've been looking all over for you. The hotel manager said you were on the floor below. Oh. Did you get a search warrant? Yeah, I have it right here. Good. This is the Sanford girl's room. I have a passkey. No sign of her, Jim? No, she left the hotel early this morning. Hasn't returned since. There was a man with her. He didn't answer to Ken's description. There we are. Go ahead, Neil. Right. I thought it might be a good idea to search your room, see if we get any leads. Now, there's a small bag over there. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I'll take a look at it. I'll see what's in that closet. All right. Did the management give you any line on what she's been doing? No, not much. He said she'd made quite a few phone calls. He's getting the slips together now. We'll pick them up on the way out. Uh, uh, nothing in this closet. Wait a minute, Neil. I got something here. No, what is it? It's a note. What's it say? Well, it's addressed to her from a man who signs himself Joe. Yes? It says that he saw Kent here. Kent is using his old name. Uh-huh. It also states that he's doing what he always wanted to do. Doing what he always wanted to do. That's it. Well, that really confuses things. <laughs> All we have to do now is find out Kent's old name and what this thing is that he's always wanted to do. <laughs> yes. 
But Neil the Sanford girl must know both these things. Well, in that case, Jim, she's probably already found him. Yes, I know, which means she may never come back here. Neil will post someone here to watch for her anyway. Let's go down and pick up those slips of the telephone call that she made. <laughs> Why don't you put that gun away? It, it makes me nervous. I'd be nervous without it. You handled me quite effectively before without a gun. You didn't know the score, then. Hmm. Uh, tell me something, will you? What is it? Why did you double-cross me? What do you mean? You started out in this deal working for me. Why did you switch? I didn't like the way you operate. Is that the only reason? Yeah. Hmm. I thought it could have been because you got a better offer. It had nothing to do with it. What has she promised you? What's it to you? I'd like to enter my bid. I don't get it. If I were to top her offer, maybe you'd come back to my team. Mister, that's just why I can't do business with you. <sighs> okay. Can we have a drink? Yeah, I guess so. And there's some scotch in the cabinet there. Would you get it? Where? On the lower shelf. I don't see anything. <coughs> well, that ties the score. Hey, Jim. Oh, yes, Neil. The warden of the state's prison just called me back. And? He questioned Lou Palmer about Kent. Did he come up with anything? No, he had no idea what Kent's old name was. How about that business he always wanted to be in? He knew nothing about that either. Ah, I see. How are you making out? Well, I've combed through Kent's record. That didn't give us anything. Any word from the hotel? No, I just called there five minutes ago. The girl still hasn't returned. Excuse me, Jim. Oh, yes, Bob. Here's a report on those telephone numbers. Oh, thanks. Oh, Bob, they get a location on all of them? Yes, it's all there. Swell. Thanks, Bob. Are these the calls the girl made from the hotel? Mm, that's right. So she made the... Uh... 21 calls. Let's see them. Okay. Here's the first one. Nightclub called the Ace of Clubs. Mm -hmm. Next, Bar 8 Club. Next, the Angel Club. Are they the... all nightclubs? Mm -hmm. So far, they seem to be. Next three are. Jim, I think we've hit something. These four are clubs, too. This could be the business Kent always wanted to be in. Yes, all these calls were to nightclubs. Did the manager of the hotel give you those calls in the sequence they were made? No, he said they were all mixed up. That's too bad. Obviously, the last call she made was where she found him. Yes, I know. Well, I guess we'll just have to go to each place and bring Kent's picture with us. That should Wait go. a minute, Neil. I don't think we'll have to do that. Why not? Look, all these clubs begin with either the letter A, B, or C. Uh-huh. She must have worked from a classified phone book, called each club in the order that it was listed. Right. In that case, the, uh, the Clover Club is the last place she called. Come on, Neil, that'll be our first place. Come in, Vi. Where's Phil? He's inside. Oh. Did you get the money? Yes. Hope you didn't have any trouble. No. Thought you said Phil was in here. There he is. Where? Right there on the floor. What? What happened? It's just my turn to hit him. Say, what is this? My party now, Vi. Let me have my money. Wait a minute. Give it to me. I shit. <laughs> I gather it's in that bag. It's not your money. It belongs to me and you know it. Honey, we're not going into that again. Besides, you will have no need for it. Why not? One has to be alive to enjoy money. What are you talking about? I'm going to have to kill you, Vi. In fact, I'm killing you both. Larry, wait and a minute. I'll be very legitimate, too. See, I came in, found you rifling my apartment, and I had to let you have You'll it. You'll never get away with it. You forget, honey. In this town, I'm an honest man. Now, would you like it first? Larry, don't. Don't. Put away that gun. Larry, Vine. Drop that gun. Go oh. on, oh, drop it, I say. Oh. Who are you? Special agents, the FBI. I'll pick oh, up his gun, Jim. Oh, you heard him. You heard what he was going to do. Oh, yes, Miss Sanford. We know all about both of you. That's where the manager let us in the back way. All right, Neil. Let's revive that man on the floor and take them all down to the office. Vi's 
Stanford was sentenced to serve 10 years in a federal penitentiary for bank robbery. Her former accomplice was given a 20-year term for the same crime. Bill West was turned over to the local authorities to be prosecuted on an old murder charge. And thus, your FBI thwarted the plans of three criminals and also apprehended one for whom they had been looking for more than two years. Two years is a long time in the life of a criminal, but not to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for their patience never runs out. Your FBI never gives up in the search for a criminal, even if it takes two, ten, or twenty years. No file is ever closed unless it is marked either convicted or dead. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, I've been thinking. I certainly hope I can qualify for that Equitable Society Assured Home Ownership Plan you were talking about. I do too, Jim, because... Look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your Equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Reluctant Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society... We'll bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Reluctant Thief on This Is Your FBI. Now, Matt Twitts with contestants as they try for amazing sums of radio's biggest money-paying quiz show, Break the Bank, which follows next. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>